and we're gonna get started. All right, so 1.1, remember we're only doing like two sections today. So, um, and we'll come back to that, that airplane one or whatever, the airp uh, airplane pilots. So make sure that you guys have filled that in. If you didn't get to it yesterday, please do it today. Uh, and I'm probably gonna look at that either tonight or in the morning, okay? So we're gonna start this section. Uh, you should be able to display categorical data with a bar graph, y'all, that's really easy. Uh, and determine if it would be appropriate to make a pie chart and then identify what makes some graphs of categorical, categorical data deceptive. That's about all we're gonna do today. We'll get back to the, the two-way table and the marginal distribution tomorrow. So the values of a categorical variable Our labels for the categories such as male and female, the distribution, of a categorical variable, <clears throat> list the categories and gives either the count or the percent. Of individuals who fall within each category. So here's an example. All right, so it says radio station formats, distribution of a categorical variable. The radio audience rating service Arbitron places US radio stations into categories that describe the kinds of programs they broadcast. Here are two different tables showing the distribution of station formats in a recent year. So again, you can see there's a frequency table, which is the count. So a frequency is with count. Relative frequency is with the percent. Now, when you graph them, they look exactly the same. It doesn't matter how you graph them. They're going to look exactly the same. But uh, again, one is with the count and one is with the percent. So you need to know that. You may have to make a frequency table or a relative frequency table. So if it's a relative frequency, you have to make sure you have the percents. Okay. Uh, why do you think that this one doesn't add up to 100%? Because it's rounded. Like yes, it's absolutely rounded. So everything should be 100%. But if it's like 99.9, .9, that's okay. Because that that's why we try not to round one decimal. We try to round uh, two or three. In stats, two is acceptable. Try to round two decimal places. Uh, I know in calculus it's like four, but in ours it's just two. So in this case, the individuals are the radio stations. Again, they're the individuals because they're what's being polled. And the variable meaning measured is what? What did they measure or what did they, what was their data from? What are our categories? The, uh, what's it say in the top? So we had to pick out individuals and then we had to pick out like all our stuff. So. What, what about these individuals? The individuals are the radio stations, but what are they looking at? The different things they broadcast. The kinds of programs they broadcast. So the variable being measured is the kinds of programming. Good job. That each station broadcasts. The table on the left, which we call a frequency table, And again, this is just telling you exactly what this is. The frequency table displays the counts or frequencies of each stations in the format category. On the right side though, we see a relative frequency table of the data. That shows the percent or relative frequencies. Of each station in each format category. Okay, so what does a frequency table show? Counts. And then. Relative frequency shows? Percent. 
percent. You need to know those two, okay? You need to know the difference. All right, any questions on this page? Everybody got it before I move it. All right. So it's a good idea to check for consistency. The count should add to whatever your total table is. So in this one, it was 138.38. which was the table total or the number of, of radio stations surveyed. And if we go back and look and we count those up, then they do add to 138.38. The percent should add to 100 and we just talked about this. In fact, they only add to 99.9%. .9%. And I asked you guys what happened and it says each percent is rounded to the nearest tenth. If we put the exact decimals, which again, we don't, because it could be 15, 16 decimal places longer, it may not end, they would add to 100%. But because we're rounding, it just comes really close to 100. When we do work, like uh, like homework or whatever, and we do have to round, what place do we usually round to? Like basic? Second, second decimal place. I would do two decimal places. This is called the round off error. And round off errors don't point to mistakes in our work, just to the effect of rounding off results. But the thing is, even if you, you round to one decimal place, as long as you're showing your work, uh, the people that are grading the AP exam, they'll go check it out and look at it. So don't, you know, don't stress out too much. They'll look, they do what I do. They look at the final answer and if it's right, they just mark it. But if it's wrong, then they have to go back and check your work. And if they see a place where like you rounded that they didn't round, so you rounded 0.4 and you carried that 0.4 and it made your number off a little bit, they're okay with that. So they go back and check everything. Uh, it makes it easier if it's what they have. That's why I say two decimal places is what they have. But they will not count you off for round off error. Okay. So then our next part is bar, uh, bar graphs and pie charts. Columns of numbers take time to read. You can use a pie chart or a bar graph to display the distribution of a categorical variable more vividly. vividly. And if you guys look down, there's a pie chart and a bar graph there, and you guys can see more like if I asked you which one uh, was listened to the most, you can automatically go over there and check it out and tell me exactly which one, where you would have to really look through that chart. I mean, this one's not hard, but if you had a huge chart, it'd be hard to look through, okay? So pie charts show the distribution of a categorical variable as a pie, whose slices are sized by the counts or percents. Most of them are gonna be percents. They can be counts, but most are gonna be percents. A pie chart must include all the categories that make up the whole. In the radio station example, we needed the other formats category to complete the whole, which was all radio stations and allow us to make a pie chart. So again, if you look, there's one right here that says other, those are not the ones that were specific in these categories and you guys know that. Use a pie chart only when you want to emphasize each category's relation to the whole. So pie charts are not always great, but they emphasize each category's relation to the whole. So that might be important for you to know. All right. So again, this is just showing you that same data that we had in the chart. It's much easier to read as graphs than it is in that chart and reading multiple numbers, okay? Bar graphs represent each category as a bar. The bar heights show the counts or percents. The 
Bar graphs are easier to make than pie charts. And you guys know that without having some kind of super breakdown in there, um, if you're making a pie chart by hand, sometimes they don't look very good and you don't get an accurate rep representation unless it's like 50% or 25%, that's pretty easy. But anything else is kind of hard. So to convince yourself, try to use the pie chart in figure 1.1 to estimate the percent of radio stations that have an oldies format. So what do you think the percent is for oldies? If we look at this, we know that it's pretty small, but it's bigger than let's say contemporary, but can we tell without them writing it down the actual percentage? No, no. we can't. Mm -mm. But if we go over here to this one and we look at it and we find oldies, can we tell the percent? Yes. Yes. So that's what it's saying. This is just relation to the whole. So we can see that it's littler than that, but it's bigger than this one. Where on the bar chart, we can see exactly what it is. So now look at the bar graph. It's easy to see that the answer is about 8%. Bar graphs are also more flexible than pie charts. Both graphs can display the distribution. Of a categorical variable. But a bar graph can also compare any set of quantities. That are measured in the same units. And that's important as well, measured in the same units. You cannot compare apples to oranges. So you can't compare centimeters to feet, okay? All right, so then we have an example. Is everybody good with all of this? Can I move to the example? Yeah. <laughs> And it says, who owns an MP3 player? Do y'all know what MP3 players are? Yes. Every yeah, I have one. That's like an old time. Oh, I don't know what that is. I, I used to play my Hannah Montana songs on that. What do you mean? You know, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so MP3 players are super old, so that's why I wondered if you guys had ever had them. And then an iPod is a base, basically the same, so... Um, Y'all would have been really little when those came out, so phones were more popular and you've been using your, your phones for music rather than using that kind of stuff, but just throwing that out there, okay? All right, portable MP3, MP3 music players such as the Apple iPod are popular but not equally popular with people of all ages. Here are the percents of people, so rem remember these are percents, of people in various age groups who own a portable mp3 player according to an arbitron survey of 1112 randomly selected people you will always see this randomly selected people because that makes it a good experiment and a good design okay so there's your age group and there's your numbers and it says make a well-labeled bar graph to display the data i'm going to try to get all of that in there so you guys can see it all All right, so to display this data all the way around, I just went ahead and gave you an L graph so that you guys could see it. So what is the highest percentage that we have? The 54. Okay, so this Y axis, which is the percent that own an MP3, has to include all of those numbers at least up to 54, but I went up to 60. I went up to 60. So what can we do our scale by? And you can do any scale that you want to, but I like to be a little bit lazier. So if I'm going to 60, I'm gonna to try to get something that's small, but not too small that I'm having to do like 50,000 tick marks. So what do you think we should go by? 15. You can, you can do 15, so I think that's a little big, but it'll work. 30. I'll do it by five. Okay, fives are gonna give you too many. Think about five to 60. That's a lot of little tick marks. Yeah. I, I did, all of these are fine. You guys are not doing anything wrong, so understand that. 
Um, 15s would be fine in this case because everything is like increments of five. So the fives, the 30s, 13 is real close to 15. So that would not be a bad choice either, but I make it easy on myself and I just did tens. So I'm gonna do tens. If you wanna do something else, do something else, but none of those are the wrong answer. It's your chart, okay? It's your chart. So this'll be your zero. And then we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. When you're making bar graphs, bar charts, any kind of charts, period, you need to make sure you label each axis. They will count off for that on your final exam or your AB exam. So you need to label everything. So that's why I did the percent that on MP3. What would the bottom one be? The age group. Yep, age group in, what, what's it say? Years. Years. Okay. All right, so something that may be different than what you've done before, we don't squish these bars together, okay? Do not squish them together. If you look at our last example with our part, uh, sorry, our pie chart and our bar graph, you don't put these bars together, okay? So the first age group was 12 to 17, and that was 54, so we're gonna take it up to 54. And I'm not putting it on the axis, I'm not using the axis at all for that. But I am gonna try to make the width of my bars the same. So this one, label it, was 12 to 17. Our next category was 18 to 24, and that was at 30. So I'm gonna leave a little gap. I'm gonna try to make them the same width and label it. This is where your graph paper comes in handy. When your uh, homework says make a bar chart or something, it makes them a little nicer, okay? A little bit easier to graph the, the lines. Your next one was 25 to 34, which was also 30. Thirty-five to fifty-four was thirteen. That might be a little high, but it's hard to see. Thirty-five to fifty-four. And then 55 or older was just five. Would it be appropriate to make a pie chart for these data and explain? What do you think? Yes or no? Let's start there. I would say no. Why? Because uh, you're not showing part of the whole, you're showing the difference between the age groups? Yes. Each age group would be its own singular whole. So 12 to 17 is one whole. If you broke those down, that would be fine. But this is not part of the whole. So again, just like she said, it's making a part of the actual answer that it says making a pie chart to display these data is not appropriate because each uh, each percent in the table refers to a different age group. So each percent. I'm confused on what you mean by the whole when she says that. <laughs> Let me finish and then I'll explain it more. Okay.
Here's a good way to tell. Add those up for me. What do you get? A number yes. a whole lot bigger than a hundred. Yes, and that's a smart answer. I mean, it really, you, you was being silly, but it, it's a very smart answer. Okay, so we want 100%, right, Haley? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so on this one, this is a number way bigger than 100%. So this is 54% of 12 to 17-year-olds, not of everybody. Oh, uh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so they're not talking about the everyone's age group, just the certain right. age group. This is only 54%, okay. yes. Okay. Is everybody else okay now? Much better? Yeah, thank you. Yep. All right. So then we're going to move on. We just have a little bit left, guys. Just a little bit left. Not much writing, more talking than writing. All right. Pop back down here where you can see it. Bar graphs compare several quantities. By comparing the heights of bars that represent the quantities. Our eyes, however, react to the area of the bars as well. Remember, I told you you wanna make them the same width as well, because if you don't make them the same width, it will draw your eye. Um, I tell my, my cheerleading girls all the time, like I can't tell if you're doing it right until you're doing it wrong. When you do it wrong, you stick out like a sore thumb. So when that bar becomes bigger or fatter than the other ones, your eye is automatically drawn to the imperfection. So. Again, our eyes, however, react to the area of the bars as well as their height. When all bars have the same width, the area, remember to find area of a rectangle is length times width. So for these bars, it's gonna be width times their height, which is the exact same thing. So don't let that throw you off. Again, to find area of the rectangle bar, it's length times width. The length is actually the height, okay? Varies in proportion to the height and our eyes receive the right impression. When you draw a bar graph, make the bars equally wide. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so who buys IMAX? Beware of the pictograph. So when Apple Incorporated in, introduced the iMac, the company wanted to know whether this new computer was expanding Apple's market share. Was the iMac mainly being brought or bought, sorry, by previous Macintosh owners or was it being purchased by first time computer buyers and by previous PC users who were switching over? To find out, Apple hired a firm to conduct a survey of 500 iMac customers each customer is categorized as a new computer purchaser, a previous PC owner, or a previous Macintosh owner. The table summarized the survey results. Question real fast before we even get to this. Would this be a good one to display with a pie chart? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. very good, because it's part of a whole. And again, your total is 100%, so that's a good, good way to tell, okay? So look at this problem. Here's a clever graph of the data that uses pictures instead of more traditional bars. How is this graph misleading? So tell me why it's so misleading. Because the, the pictures are different sizes. Yeah, and if we look, the difference between like, uh, you can't see me pointing, but the, the Windows one compared to like this one is probably not a lot, but then it makes Macintosh look huge. When really, if we look at this, the number of buyers is from 100 to like, stop it, I'm about to run out of time, 10 minutes, is not that bad, okay? So why would companies do this? To make one look bigger than the other? Yeah, so what this did was make Macintosh look like everybody's buying it, and then if they showed this to everybody, people would be like, oh, well, they must be, they must be really good for everybody to buy it. So the graph is misleading in that way. All right, uh, da, 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 da. we're gonna flip. If you wanna just write us you know, a little sentence about that, that's not a big deal. Two possible bar graphs of the data are shown below. Which one could be considered deceptive and why? Uh, Jessica? 
The one with the ten at the bottom. Yeah, the second one. Wow. Because the ten's at the bottom, so it makes it look like it's like less than that or near zero. So it actually makes the PC look worse than what it actually is, doesn't it? So if we're looking at this, the PC looks very comparable to this, this Nun, and it's not terrible with the Macintosh, but here, look at the difference. Like your eyes make it, these bars are pretty much the same. These two change, and that makes it crazy. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. All right. There are two important lessons to be learned from this example. The first one is beware of the pictograph. And then make sure that you watch your scales. Okay. Uh, that's where we're supposed to stop today. Um, I think we're going to, but tomorrow might end up being split into two days. Okay, so we'll see what we can get done on here. But then, like I said, it may be split and I may have to readjust the modules. So what will happen is uh, in the modules, you will see if we don't get through, I will put that quiz, like I'll split it up, do like these questions today and these tomorrow or whatever, or we can just do the one quiz and I'll count it for both days. I don't know. Um, I'll talk to you about what happens if we run out of time. Actual quiz or the homework? That's like late it's, home, it's homework. Okay. It's the same thing. When I say quiz and homework, it's interchangeable. The only thing that you're assigned. Okay, so we do have homework tonight that needs to be done. Yes. Okay. But I may split tomorrow's homework. So let me. I'll look at that uh, based on what we finish, and then go from there. Okay. So you might have a bunch of homework tomorrow that I can split because we're not going to get through those notes. I don't think in the forty-minute time limit. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, if y'all don't have any more questions, I'm going to let you go. And then if you do have questions, hang on here. So I stopped my share. And then, like I said, y'all are more than welcome to go.